Ladies and gentlemen, I would like now to call our sixth speaker to talk on Saba and Sarawak economy and resources. Would you please put your hand together to call upon Associate Professor Dr. Ferdaus Sufian from Saba. Assalamualaikum and uh, very good afternoon everyone. Uh, the reason I stand up here, I mean, you know, it's quite difficult after you had your lunch and it's now at 2 o'clock, so they want you to put your heads up, right? Because if I stand over there, put your heads down, same goes with the eyes, right? So, anyway, um, <coughs> anyway, um, first of all, uh, when we talk about uh, Sabah and Sarawak economy and resources, it's quite difficult especially when you talk about economics after you had your lunch. I hope you're going to stay awake, right? That, don't worry, I'm not going to show you Y equal to AB plus X. Nothing to do with that, right? But uh, just so you know, first of all, uh, as we speak right now, uh, the global trade and also global trading around the world is slowing down. Even though trade show a bit of a positive sign, however, it is not as good as the one if you compare with the pre-pandemic number one. Number two, the COVID-19 uh, effect. A lot of us might probably have forgotten about that. Well, the lag effect and the way how it tanked our economy, uh, to be honest, is severe, right? Uh, because I look at the data, just like Dr. James Allen, you know, look at the data, um, it is pretty much uh, worrying. However, despite those numbers going down, well, there are lights and hope. The silver lining is there. Ladies and gentlemen, when we are in Sabah and Sarawak, just so you know, right? Sabah and Sarawak is in Malaysia. Malaysia is the 38th largest economies in the world, number one. Number two is in ASEAN. ASEAN has 3.6 trillion GDP, 600 million uh, people. And remember, we are very close to China, which is 1.6 billion people. And also the Muslim uh, uh, market is around 1.8 billion. So Sabah and Sarawak is like a diamond, right? But just like a diamond, in uh, you know, the nature of diamond, you have to take it out and polish before it becomes diamond, right? Now, um, just so you know, Sabah and Sarawak, I want to repeat this, we are economic powerhouse to Malaysia, right? Let me finish that sentence in terms of resources. <laughs> well, no, Selangor, Penang, these are economic powerhouse when it comes to manufacturing and all that. Now, uh, so first of all, why I say real economic powerhouse, if you look at the data, despite after COVID-19, right, GDP contribution to the state is really pretty much high. Sabah, 4%, 5%. This is, this is pre-pandemic, yeah? So, um, uh, you know, is quite, quite big to the, to the country, including Sarawak as well, 6 to 9%. So Sabah, Sarawak, if you combine, you know, we contribute close to 10% to the GDP. And Malaysia GDP is 1.3 trillion, it's quite big. Yeah? So the total GDP value is around 81 billion, while Sarawak is 140 billion. I think you heard this from the previous speaker before me, right? And they're rich with resources, you know, crude oil, gas, palm oil, aluminium, rubber, you name it. Uh, Sabah, 42% of our palm, we contribute 42% of our palm oil to Malaysia. And Malaysia is the second largest palm oil producer in the world, right? Uh, when it comes to crude oil, um, I think uh, you can hear from jo, Dr. Joe Saman as well. You know, we contribute, Sabah, Sarawak contribute significantly to uh, petroleum industry. Labor force in Sabah, 1.9 million. Uh, I think you have seen it from Dr. James, you know, my guru there. How are you, sir? Right? <laughs> so, um, um, uh, 1.9 million. Young labor force is around 15 to 25. Young means productive. But young also means that if they come out at 15 years old and working, there is something wrong with the household. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, Sarawak, 1.3 million, labor force, and both state, for your information, we receive the highest development fund as compared to any other states in, uh, in uh, Malaysia, right? So Sabah got 6.8 billion, Sarawak get 5.8 billion, sorry, 6.5 billion for Sabah. So uh, if you look 10 years before this, 10 years, yeah, uh, we received the highest. Sabah, for your information, the development fund is larger than combined four state, Perlis, Terengganu, Pahang, and also Kelantan. You combine four, become one Sabah. We receive a lot. Now, I, I want to be as much as critical, but after COVID-19 and all the problem we heard from the younger generation and the data that we have, I want to give you a bit of hope, right? Like, let's look at the silver lining. Where can we go after this? I know there's a lot of a political issue, economic issue, but where can we go after this? After all, all of us here, we want to see development, isn't it? Right? Now, so this is the midterm review. Midterm review has specifically talked about optimizing regional economic potential. Specifically spell out this state. They want to make sure their uh, resources is optimized and a significant, uh, significant uh, allocation, particularly education, healthcare, and also the development, development fund as well for the state, right? They give special consideration, particularly for Sabah and Sarawak. Well, we can talk about that later in the slide. I will show you what are the focus by the federal government. Yeah? Now, um, let's look at this. These are the uh, high-income nation, but there are disparities across the state. So let's look at where is, um, you know, we are not munchit lah, kan? We still, uh, you know, it's all right, okay? But let's look at Sarawak, of course, they are far more, in um, terms of uh, uh, income, they are higher lah, as, as compared to Sabah, all right? But if you look at, in terms of percentage, the progress that we had, all right, uh, it is a positive growth. Right? It is positively, it's not negative, it's not regressive in nature, but rather progressive. Right? Now, so our income, we want to be a uh, you know, high income nation with $14,000 um, GNI. So I think um, um, uh, Sabah is, um, is, hang on, Let, I forgot about this. All right. Hang on, hang on. Uh, all right. No, no. All right. Let's look at the uh, growth rate and contribution to the country. Yeah? So the one Sabah, the blue one, if you look at it, our GDP, just like, um, just like um, what uh, Dr. James just now presented, so 3.7, Malaysia is 6.5, and then if you look at, uh, sorry, uh, Sarawak is 6.5, 8.7 is Malaysia. So our GDP growth rate for both states has not yet achieved a higher, so-called higher than the national um, uh, uh, national rate, but when it comes to contribution, if you look at that slide, uh, if you look at Sarawak and Sabah, we contribute a lot, like to the country's GDP. So that's why I say Sabah and Sarawak, this Borneo block is an economic powerhouse, even though Professor James is not here, he said there is no economic uh, Borneo block. Yeah? Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> Um, I mean, uh, we agree to disagree, lah. Okay, there are things agree to disagree. All right, all right. Now, um, let's look at the state revenue. So, for the past five years, if you look at it, uh, Sabah and Sarawak, we uh, our revenue. If you compare with other state, none of those state actually achieve the five billion or four billion point five marks. Only Sabah and Sarawak did this, right? So we can, so of course, um, um, Selangor, Penang, Johor didn't even reach that 4 billion mark. They did not. Only Sabah and Sarawak did that. So both expenses of the state, of course, even though it's high, if you look at both states, if you look at their uh, balance, uh, balance sheet, um, a lot of those money goes to the expenses of uh, you know, operating, OPEX they call it, uh, operating expenditure. So you're looking at 74 to 80 percent just to maintain paying salary and uh, so forth, yeah, uh, paying the GLC as well. So, 
right? So, <laughs> but no, no, but um, no, no, no. I think uh, I mean to maintain the state is expensive, but the income is high, right? So because of in, because of operating expenditure is high, so the development fund from state. I think uh, we have a TKSU here, is it? Uh, sorry, the assistant. Sorry, Assistant Minister, sorry YB, right? So I think uh, he, he knows this, yeah? So we're looking at just 80% um, goes to expenses, so looking at 20% for development. That's why we depend a lot from the development fund from the federal, right? So that is um, very uh, challenging. Huh? Now, uh, this is the development fund. If you look at it, uh, how much Sabah getting and how much Sarawak getting for the past five years, from 2018, we always get a lot, right? Sabah, Sarawak, so 6.6, um, 5.8. There's a lot of money. Now, Sabah and Sarawak received the highest development fund, and apart from Selangor that received 5 billion, it depends, it depends, 5 billion, but no state in Malaysia received as high as Sabah, so, um, so Kelantan, the poorest state, received only close to 2 billion, right? And then develop fund, development fund managers and overseas by State Development Council, Mesyuarat Majlis Tindakan Pembangunan Negeri. So this is where the Chief Minister Chair, and then um, I, I think, well, we have YB and we also have uh, bureaucrats here. Um, you know, usually this one play a very important role uh, to present what is our proposal for development. It has to be concrete, has to be very clear, because development fund is given to the federal state agency in Sabah, not to the state. Right? Uh, people argue that we should go to the state. No, because the budget, budgeting system in public finance, there are certain conventions that we follow. Right? Uh, that would be very different, uh, it's, and it's difficult to do that. Yeah? Now, um, this is very important to have this meeting. But on top of that, despite this is Majlis Tindakan Pembangunan Negeri, but there are two important councils that actually control the entire fiscal uh, policy in Malaysia, which is the National Financial Planning and also National Development uh, Plan. These are the two, uh, you know, like top, the highest echelon when it comes to uh, allocating development fund. Usually, it's very political, uh, you know, according to some politician, right? Now, uh, let's look at poverty, right? So, poverty has worsened post-pandemic. I think you know this already. Uh, Sabah, Sarawak, you know, both of us, uh, you know, you know this... Um, which is um, quite sad. These are the revised methodology after uh, Professor Alston, uh, the uh, United Nations repertoire came and then revised the methodology and this is the latest one. And you see 25%, um, which is, um, we have to work hard on that, all right? Now, um, poorest district in Malaysia, you can see, I think, um, um, uh, Mr. Robert Lau already explained to you just now. So this is the poorest state, right? Um, yeah, I mean, this is the poorest state, yeah. <laughs> but it's all right. Look, Sabah is big, though. Despite the development fund is, uh, is uh, considerable compare, as compared to other states, but our state is big. Sarawak is big as well. But the question is, um, sometimes it's... it's um, Poverty, when it comes to poverty eradication, right, uh, it cannot be a blanket policy. It has to empower the poor people at times. You have to look at how the Ketua Kampung, I think you know this well, especially like Robert Lawis and MP uh, YB himself, all right? Sometimes you cannot have a blanket policy. Look, okay, kita buat cake untuk uh, upskill. No, 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 no. You don't sell cake in certain places, right? They, you have... There cannot, it cannot be a blanket policy, but rather a local, kind of empowering the local people. What are the things that they can do to have that access? Access means um, access their produce, agriculture produce, or whatever product they're selling. I think that is the key problem, right? Now, um, unemployment rate, I think Dr. James already talked about it, right? So you can see... Um, uh, Sabah and Sarawak as well. We are not too high though, it's alright. Okay, it's 5%. <laughs> uh, no, no, I mean, um, I mean, it's high, but this is a bit of structural issue, alright? 
uh, structural and also a bit of um, um, and money as well, right? Now, uh, the median income household 2016 until 2020. So if you look at the growth rate for Sabah from 2016-19, so we have a progressive, when it comes to growth, it is 3.04%, right? Uh, which is all right. And then from, uh, instead of negative growth rate, but we recorded positive growth rate. And then uh, from 2019-2022, approximately 8% for Sarawak, all right? Uh, sorry, uh, that's Sabah. And for Sarawak, on the other hand, they are different lah, because, you know, it's higher. Um, there's a research by World Bank in 2020. In 2020, they presented to, um, I think to, I think to, uh, I mean, academicians, some, I think bureaucrats, there's a special session with the World Bank. So they show that the disparities between Sabah and Sarawak. So Sarawak, you have high income, but high poverty. And then Sabah, you have high income, uh, low income, high poverty. So it's the other way around. So they found out one thing in Sarawak is that the one that drives the economy is the oil and gas industry. Even though, you know, PDA is a bit sensitive, but the way how they tap into the market, how they tap into the sector by the state, I think Datu Sri Fong already mentioned that, you know, how strong, aggressive they did that. Uh, actually, that push up the average of uh, income. But I'm talking about average. You have to unpack and look. Every detail then that will be different. For Sabah, on the other hand, we already did. I mean, now we have SMJ, so it gives a hope and also silver lining. Uh, income, to be honest, is progressive, all right? And then there are some I investment from Eskenisilis, Kibbing, all this give uh, hope for Sabah actually to push the income. So, um, I know as much as we want to be critical about it, but it's progressing from, I mean, statistically speaking, right? Now, uh, this is the median, median wage for Sabah and Sarawak. So if you look at it, uh, median is much more accurate like, if you compare with average. Yeah? So if you look at the compound annual growth rate for Malaysia is 4%, we are higher than Malaysia when it comes to uh, our compound annual growth rate. And then Sarawak is 10 point, um, 10.5%, so it's higher. Lah. I think uh, recently, I think Abang Joe did mention the way how, uh, mentioned uh, about the in, the, their, how they have increased their income, um, which is very interesting to look at. Huh? And then uh, income and inflation in Sabah. So is, I know inflation is something that uh, bothering us, but uh, just so you know, um, inflation is high for both states, but the, the, the one that worrying me the most is the one that eating out. You know, if you eat out in Sabah, the inflation rate is 7.3%. I think all of you feel that pinch, yeah? Now, so I'm gonna go very quickly. So this is access to public, uh, public facilities. I got it from Dossum. So far, I think Sabah has this one. Uh, less than five kilometers when it comes to healthcare, 66% only. Um, same goes with Sarawak as well. Right? And also secondary school, access to secondary school. It's only, um, you know, Sarawak is lower, Sabah a bit higher, right? And uh, this is a mobile broadband for internet, you know. All right, it's okay. So this is the one that boosts, uh, Malaysia, boosts Sabah and Sarawak. So Sarawak, they have this post-COVID-19 uh, strategy, which is very interesting to look at, especially when it comes to renewable energy. So hydrocarbon and carbon, hydrogen and carbon capture, Sarawak is leading. If you look at the plant economy, Madani 2030, they are leading. In fact, uh, uh, I mean, they are the leader compared to any other state, including the I mean, federal government even praised that. Yeah? And then Sabah is on its way as well. If you look at renewable energy, it's there too. Uh, these are the plans that actually boost our uh, economy. These are the two important plans, right? So you have Sabah Maju Jaya and then Sarawak Makmur. Hey, Sarawak Maju Makmur. Now, uh, this is both the top investment. So both of us are always top invest. Uh, I mean, top destination for investment, right? So these are the share. So this I collect uh, the data that I get from uh, how much investment have been approved. So Sabah and Sarawak. So this is for Sabah. Um, in fact, there are so many interesting. Um, development plan right now. Uh, 
uh, when it comes to Sabah. So these are the things that actually will boost our economy. If this thing happens, uh, keep our finger crossed, politically stable, and then it will push our GDP to 4 or 5% again. Right? Same, same goes with uh, Sarawak as well. Uh, if this thing happened, I think that one, the hydrogen and carbon capture, uh, that one is, um, is a new thing for, for Sarawak. Hang on. Um, this one, the Sabah Energy Roadmap and Master Plan 2040. So this one gives a big um, hope as well for Sabah. So uh, this one, I can end. I think I disagree. I mean, agree to disagree with Professor James. This one is the big, uh, you know, uh, in fact, uh, spin-off because this will help trade. So the the IKN, or Ibu Kota Nusantara, I think this one will give a new light for Borneo, right? Because Bakun is providing energy for uh, Kalimantan. And um, navigating asymmetry, so this is what the income, 91% concentrated in Sarawak, right? It's concentrated in federal government, so we only get 9% I mean only, right? So these are the problems that we have, education, health, infrastructure, centralized. So how much we spend? If you look at, this is the data, we only spend, if you compare with other countries that have a federal setup, we only spend 4% compared to even Indonesia is higher, higher than us, Thailand higher than us when it comes to spending on state. So we spend very little, right? So uh, decentralization, uh, these are the policies that, what are the decentralizing efforts currently, what the government trying to do, right? Um, again, federation is incomplete without decentralization. I'm going to throw you this. I think I agree with Datu Sri Fong to some extent. Give me just one minute very quickly. Um, you know, as much as political, um, you know, tend to sensationalize issue, but when it comes to decentralization, it's pretty much a very administrative issue and also have to look at the legality of that. France decentralized, started at the fifth uh, amendment of the Constitution in 1953, and the local authority only get their sent power in 23, two, uh, sorry, 2003. Korea make four times re referendum of their Constitution to change, to decentralize the state and also the local government. Now, whatever it is what we do, there is no one size fits all when it comes to decentralization. What we need to ask right now is what we want to decentralize. The specificity uh, supersede anything that we talk about education, but what sort of education we want, what sort of administrative function that we want, what sort of executive power that we want, what sort of budget we want. So all these have to be detailed out. And this one, you really, my, 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 I mean, my, no offense, my fellow politician, it has to go to the civil servant to churn out what are the details because they know better. Well, you need the political will to drive, to drive that sentiment, but the legality, the specificity, is always the NGO, the civil servant that have to do this. Things have done before in other countries, we can do that as well. So whatever it is, ladies and gentlemen, federation is incomplete without decentralization. Decentralization is the only way to bloom our economy in Sabah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Firdausi.